Hi, I'm Dan Fister from Strategic Winback in Toronto. And the word possibility to me means looking just beyond the horizon, just beyond the horizon of the possible. Something that is still doable and it's a real stretch, but it's uh, but it generates this real sense of uh, of excitement and uh, and almost wonder. So that's what possibility means to me. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, possibility seekers around the world. We have a great episode today on the art of the possible. And the art of the possible special guest is Dan Fister, all the way from Toronto. And we're going to talk about winning back customers from his business, Strategic Winback. How are you, Dan? I am doing great. I'm doing great, Rob. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about this one because uh, the art of the possible sometimes is about well, how do you, if you lose a customer, how do you win the back? And some people think that's impossible to do. But you, you got into the business called Strategic Win Back. Let's, let's go back a little bit. How did you get into this business and get fascinated by you know, winning back customers? Well, you know, it actually started, I was solving my own problem. Um, uh, myself and a few partners, we started this business in 1998. And we'd, we'd created, uh, we generated 50,000 customers and I was the marketing person, right? I was the one who was responsible for attrition and, and uh, you know, getting, getting people in the door anyway. So uh, it was 2016 and um, we had a particularly bad year for attrition and we had done every, pretty well everything we could. And I was just looking at the numbers and, and normally we just look at recurring revenue, but, but I thought it, you know, I'd like to dig a lot deeper. So I looked at the, it wasn't only the lost recurring revenue. I looked at the lost referral revenue, uh, the, 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 the lost upsell, cross-sell revenue. Uh, and then there was all the cost of replacing the customer. And man, you know, I added it all up and it was, it was, a, it was a serious number. And then I looked at all the customers we'd lost in the last two years and I was basically almost sick. So, uh, so what I did is I just figured I got to do something. I got to, try to, to, to do something to win these people back. And so I put together a program and there's really very little out there on win back, you know? And uh, so it was a pretty primitive program. And I, were, and I really wasn't that optimistic because, you know, we already done everything we could with, uh, with attrition to keep, to keep people uh, on board. And I'd done some, some outreach to try to get people back. And so I didn't think there was much, you know, there was much uh, uh, water left in the bowl. Uh, but anyway, we did this. Uh, I did this program because I was just so upset with uh, with what what this was costing us, and we got a fifty seven x ROI right out of the gate with this primitive program. So there's a long winded uh, explanation of of how that happened. Well, take us back to that because I, I think it was interesting. Uh, you said a lot of things in that, but as a marketer, um, you were clearly very ROI driven, um, which not Definitely, all marketers yeah. are. Yeah, so yeah. that was, I think, that's the first one. And you were really concerned about that. What, were you running a CRM? Were you, how did you know about that data? So some of the data about the, the, the recurring revenue, the loss, you could actually see that. Would, was that in spreadsheets, in CRM? How did you kind of get all that data? Yeah, well, we, we, uh, I like to talk a lot to customers. I like to get a lot of, uh, we do a lot of surveys. Um, I learned how to do surveying from one of the best guy, uh, gentlemen named uh, Glenn Livingston. And he really opened my eyes on how to ask questions and how to get real answers or at least reasonably valid answers. And so, you know, we found that, you know, we, we got a, a good idea of what uh, a new customer, how much they'll buy in upsells versus an, uh, an existing customer, like somebody who's been around for a couple of years. And the numbers were pretty substantially different, like three, four, five times more, depending on the product. Um, and then we saw other companies like uh, Client Success, they, they basically validated that. Uh, we had a pretty good idea of uh, what kind of referral business we got. So we knew, you know, for every hundred customers, you know, we get X number of referrals. So we had a lot of, we had a lot of data around that. And basically it was just a matter of uh, putting it all together. And were those, those, when you said you had a referral, was that a referral system you had in place? So you had referral processes that it was more of a, a formal referral program or more ad hoc? We, it, you know, it was ad hoc. You know, we, we would go out and we would ask people for referrals. We, we should have been doing this sort of thing on a very structured, you know, timetable. And we didn't. And that was on me. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you were doing this from a marketing um, perspective, and so you just give us a bit of background on that business though. So was it, was it a B2B or B2C type business you were running? It was, it was, it was both actually. Um, what it was, was uh, we sold business information. And so we'd sell it to, uh, you know, you know, IBM, 
Fidelity, you know, all kinds of big companies. Right. Uh, we, we'd also sell it one-on-one to individuals. Uh, we sold it through business associations. Um, you know, so we did a lot, we had a lot of partnerships. So, you know, it was always, uh, we sold to a lot of financial advisors because we had a, another arm that was just on, on, uh, on books. So it keep, help keep them up to date. Right. And, and so with, were you doing um, formal win-loss as well, win-loss analysis to understand why customers were leaving as well as why you'd won customers? You know, that's the thing. We, we weren't. We were doing win analysis. We weren't doing win-loss analysis. Right. You know, um, uh, and, and like the thing is, is that at the time, all we were concerned about was grow, grow, grow. You know, I mean, our, the, our, our sales my sales partner was like that. The, the COO was like that. I was like that. We really wanted to grow. You know, we came into this in 1998 and it was just crazy. Then there was just so much opportunity. All these companies had funding. I mean, we were getting, we were doing deals with, we were just doing crazy. It was just crazy. And we got really addicted to growth. And then we got the stuffing kicked out of us in 2001, 2002 with the well, this crash. This is around the dot-com area, Dan. So it is. You, you, it, you it and is. I can't remember that. We we're working in that space. I remember that space. So you're, you're right. Yeah. 98, I was doing, uh, 98, I was doing e-commerce at HP. So e-business was called the e-business unit back then. Um, but you're right. So it was all grow, wasn't it? And it was this kind of net grow. And it was just so much growth going on that if you lost a few, you, you kind of were picking up so much newer business that you didn't really have to focus. Would that be fair no, on the kind of no. stuff you were losing, you know? Yeah, you learn a lot as you get older. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But yeah, we we yeah we were just in this super high growth mode. We'd be bringing in just you know, uh, back in those days, you know, e-commerce as you know wasn't very uh, stable, and you know we'd have campaigns, and you know when they when they'd launch, we'd be getting you know a, a cu- uh, three customers a second, and you know all you were concerned with is that your system stayed up, you know, right. and. Uh, um, you know, that would go on for hours and then you just go in and you just be looking, uh, what's that next big thing where we can, what's that next big deal we can do? Yeah. yeah. So is, in your view, is there a, is there a top three reasons that um, people, you know, customers leave a business? Yeah. You know, it, it depends a lot on the industry. Like there's some industries where it's all about customer satisfaction, you know, where you find that, you know, 70% of the people leave because uh, of some kind of a bad interaction with, uh, with either uh, uh, the company itself or the product uh, in B2B. Um, there's a lot of uh, the grass is greener, you know, somebody right. else has got a, you know, brand new shiny uh, uh, object uh, that, that people chase people are lured away uh, by competitors offering the bigger, better deal. So there's, you know, there's all kinds of reasons like that. And what we found when we were doing, when we started doing actual surveys with this, and when we did the uh, uh, study, is we found a lot of people just left because they were bored. They wanted to try something new, you know. And that, was, that was just, that's just, that's just astounded me, you know. And um, yeah, it's like people always wanted, you know, they want something new, they want something fresh. And sometimes they'll actually leave a vendor that's doing a decent job because somebody else came and said, Hey, we can do better. And that lure of new is a, is a big deal. And um, Dan, Dan, I can, do you I can think just on, say, yeah, I was going to ask you a question on just, just on that point about, do you think though, that on the other side, the, the, the potentially the account management or sales team get complacent and just assume the customer is going to keep on buying from them. So they almost get into a routine. Did, did you find that? Oh, that's, that's, that's huge. That's almost like, uh, that's, the, that, that is for, for, for B2B, that that is that complacency that, you know, we talked about when, when a customer, when, when people don't feel like they're being heard, they're being respected, they're being uh, paid attention to that's, that's a big deal. Like you, people are taken for granted. And, 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 you know, I was, I was talking to a gentleman, they had five huge telcos and they basically took them for granted and kept going after, you know, their, their net new logos. And they, they ended up losing these and they had to work like crazy to win them back. And that's a really interesting story, but, mm. but yeah, that's where, you know, we're all guilty of that. So thanks for uh, chiming in and, and guiding me back to the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I was just interested because um, when I did work in the advertising industry, it was very common that they would change agencies uh, because they just, what they would say is, oh, the other guys are doing a great job, but we just wanted something new and fresh. 
right? And, and the agency was doing a great job. And it would lo- what I always thought was funny, Dan, was they would lose the account and then the new agency would pick up this new account. But then it would hire the same account team at the old agency and move oh, them across really? to the new agency because they knew so much and they had to scale really quickly. So the client really didn't get that much additional creative and they were kind of leaving. But what they said, I think it's sometimes the, the customer was saying here, Oh, the other guys were doing a great job. We just something we wanted something new and fresh. But I think what they were really saying was, we weren't getting any more love. We felt we were taken for granted. So yeah, I think that's that's huge. That is huge. And and you know that can that can be reflected in people saying and then uh, poor customer service because how do they express that? Do they say, oh, you're not phoning me enough? No, they all. They'll come out and they'll find they'll they'll do fault finding is is one thing we found, you know the client will do fault finding with, with with things that really weren't that big of a deal and we know they weren't that big of a deal because after they go to the new place, after four or five months that whole new that whole aura of new wears off and you can go back to those people then and say listen we understood that we didn't do you know X Y and Z. And we really do want you back and we really do appreciate your business. And if we didn't show that before, we really are, you know, and you just, you just go through this. I mean, there's many different ways of engaging, but um, this is, this is definitely one big thing, not feeling the love. Yeah. Not feeling the love. Um, What are your thoughts around, um, you know, companies, you know, changing up their account team every so often, like keeping that fresh. Has that been a, a, a strategy that works? Well, you know, it, it really depends on the actual team. You know, when you when you get an account into a company, you know, you've got to build that that trust, right? You've got to get to the point where, wow, they really trust you. They trust your competency. They trust that you're on their side. And so, switching up switching up teams can really be counterproductive in that way. However, if the team isn't functioning really well, and if they're not doing what they need to do, then, then of course, you know, of course. Um, I ahead. found that um, one, and I agree with that too. Once, if a, t- if a team's harmonious and it's working well, then you know, hands off, don't change it. What I've found sometimes um, customers can stray is when the the customer team changes, but the selling team doesn't. So the account management team doesn't. And, and they keep and they treat that new team like the old team. Sometimes I've found then there's a bit of a disconnect. Have you seen that? Definitely, definitely. I think that's that's a big deal. You know, you you just people are used to a certain way of doing things. Certain people that they're in contact with. They we all have our little. You know, you've already you know that customer's trained you to to act and and and, and work in a certain way, and then then the new team doesn't have that. You know, to put it very quickly and simply. Yeah. Some of the data, I mean, you've done some work with people like Jeb Blount, who had some really interesting data on winning new clients versus winning back old ones, like the expense of winning net new versus actually going, you know, winning back an old one. Can you, can you share some of those, the data or some of the thoughts that he had on that? Yeah. So uh, uh, Jeb wrote a book, massive, massive book called Fanatical Prospecting. It actually got voted uh, number one sales book of all time uh, on LinkedIn a while ago. And what what Jeb said was that it takes on average one to three touches to re-engage a past customer. And it takes at least seven times as many with a regular prospect. And, you know, my guess is with COVID, that number has gone you know, even I, farther higher. I was going to ask you that because I would have thought that could have even doubled that number we under under the, the pandemic, just in terms of are they still there? <laughs> um, where, are they in the same role? Uh, you know, just that whole change that's gone up. Yeah, I, I would think that is probably the case. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't have any I don't have any statistics around it, but you see people constantly talking about how much harder it is to engage people uh, these days. You know, um, b- budgets are being cut. People are still freaked out. They're you know, there's, there's, there's so much uncertainty. Of course, some businesses are doing great and it's not, that's not the case, but you know, by and large, I think that's, that's, that's 100% true. Yeah. I was talking to um, a CEO this morning, actually. And I was talking, I was saying, I was going to have a chatting to you and he was really interested. Um, and then he was saying, you know, he's, he's new BD people when they come on are really struggling to do, to get traction um, and to get connected. And, and he was really interested in the win back. And so I'm going to ask you a question, which he asked me, he said, Hey, can you ask Dan this question, which is 
what would, what would be the you know two or three things you'd, you'd start off doing when you wanted to do a win back campaign when you, when you wanted to try and win back customers as opposed to going for net new what what are some things you could you could uh, start to do well you know the first thing is you've got to identify them you know so you'd create a list of like your what i what i like to do is we 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 list all our past customers out, say for the last two or three years, whatever makes sense, depending on your numbers, right? So you 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 list all those people out. And what you want to do is you want to find the high potential ones. You want to find the ones that are going to contribute the most to the bottom line. So what we do is we rank uh, everybody. And, you know, there's some very basic ranking we start off with. So first it's, it's recency, right? So the more recent, the better chance you'll win them back. So that's, that's one part of the formula. Uh, another part of the formula is their... Uh, first lifetime value. How much did they spend with you over that time? Uh, that's a, a huge predictor of a future revenue. Um, then there's other things like um, if they're large accounts, you know, if you talk to, you know, the uh, everybody who's had, you know, touch the customer, you know, what do you think the chances are? How did they leave? Like, you know, why did they leave? So there's another, like, what do you uh, subjectively think that the probability of winning them back is okay. I'm sorry. I'm going into too much detail about this. No, that's so, good. So, but, good. Okay. Okay. Great. So, so you identify these people, um, uh, you gather their names, you know, and, um, uh, then you, then, then you do a sort, right? So what we're going to do now is we're going to sort, uh, assign a number to each one of these people. So then we just, uh, do a, a sort in the spreadsheet. And we find, okay, so these are the people at the top, these are people at the bottom, middle, and these are the people at the bottom. And so what we do is we, we reach out to a subset of each group to try to find out uh, why they'd left. You know, have their needs changed? Um, what will it take to win you back? That kind of thing, right? So, so we basically gather some core information from a, from a subset of these people. And we like to gather the information from each set because down the road, we're going to, you know, these high value people, we're probably going to want to spend a lot more money on them, right, to win them back. And the, the medium value people, we're going to spend less. And the lowest value people, we're going to sp- spend the very least. So we, if, if they've got different needs, if it will take different things to win them back, we want to know that too. So, so that's kind of like there's step two, that's the, uh, the research part. And then the next thing is the refine stage. So you might find that, um, when you talk to people, they might say, you know what, your solution is just a little out of sync with where we are now or where, where the market is right now. So, so the idea here is to, uh, if you find that, you know, you're going to have to refine your solution. You're going to have to make some changes. So, so you, you make those changes and I'll just throw in a little side note here yeah. is that past customers can really help you drive uh, product development, you know, they, they intimately know already what you offer and they know what they want. Right. So, uh, so they can tell you what, what, what needs have changed. And, you know, sometimes they'll even partner with you to work with you on creating a solution just wow. for themselves, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, they're, what could be better. Right. So, so they can, no one can deliver these kind of insights, right. A focus group can't do it. You know, uh, prospects can't do it. Nobody knows you or. Uh, right. Cause they way. know you so well. So they, cause they, they've already, they, they've got, there is a level of trust. They know you and what your perceived capabilities are and why they left. Um, yeah, I can see how that could really work. So they can really give you some insight into terms of where they're going and where they felt there was a misalignment to help you on either product development. Um, so, so I've got a question for you then. So when you're finding out this information from the customers left, do, right. who, who are the people that do that? Are there, what's the skill set of the people who are finding this out? Well, you know, what I like, to, it, it, you know, it depends, of course, on the size of the organization. I like somebody to go out there and do the initial outreach, the initial engagement um, by who is, you know, maybe like a head of marketing, not, not the actual salesperson who lost the account. Mm. Um, and I just think that's say, important. Oh, yeah. Um, it'll, the, the, you know, because they'll, they'll be a little freer to open. I mean, you know, you don't want to say bad things about people, somebody that you left, you know, you feel bad. A lot of people feel bad enough just about leaving. So, yeah. So, so maybe like a, you know, head of marketing or, or, or you know, I, whomever, but not that, not that particular salesperson, at least yes. not at the beginning. Okay. At yeah. least not at the beginning. And, uh, you know, they will go out and they'll approach the, uh, the, the person is sort of like, you know, I'm here to learn. We lost you. You're a valuable customer. And uh, you know, we want to do better. And I was wondering if you could take, you know, 15 minutes and just let, let us know why something like that, something very, very low key to begin with. 
Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. But if I could just get back to the customer development, yeah, the, sure. just for one second, I just, cause it's kind of important. I mean, if you're talking to a CEO that might have, might mm. have a little bit of a uh, little, a little bit more into, into uh, value to, to uh, uh, deliver here. But anyway, the point is, so we were talking about, you get a, uh, you, 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 you you talk to the, the, the customer, they say, you know, this is what we need. And, and then you co-create with them. And uh, you know, there's a story we hear over and over again. And uh, I heard it, you know, most recently from, uh, from Alex Hamlin and uh, he was tasked with winning back past customers. He reached out, he found out what he needed, uh, what he needed to change. And so what he did is he offered uh, the uh, customer the opportunity to co-create with them. So they created this new version of their software together. And because they created it together, getting constant customer feedback, they created exactly what they needed. And, and so of course he won that customer back, but you know, this is what Alex said to me, said that the beauty of this was that when we were done, we understood the needs of this type of customer so much better. And now we had a solution to win back all other customers that were like those people. So they had a tremendous win back rate there. And then, you know, there was another huge bonus was that now they had something that their competitors didn't have. So they actually generated a whole new revenue stream. So um, I, I just, I just wanted to get that in because, you know, this whole business development area is, is really a huge deal with win back. Yeah. And so it's actually, I love you finishing that off because it's now created another product line, uh, another unique selling proposition yeah. Yeah. Um, that you can leverage that um, in, into other accounts that are similar to that. So, and, and you've partnered with it. We, I think the other thing is you build a huge relationship and a referral source would be the other thing I think from, from that, from being able to partner with that, uh, with that particular customer. Yeah. Um, and, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go. Yeah, go. Okay. So, and when you're going into that new market to, to sell that, you can go and say, your salespeople can go and say, look at these guys. They did it. They did it. They did it. You know, you've already got this, this, this whole group of use cases, you know, or of case studies. And, um, and also you could use this to save your at-risk customers, right? You've got customers that got one foot out the door. Well, if you've got this new thing, you can save these people, a, a lot of these people too. But that's a whole other discussion, saving at-risk customers. So I, yeah, I love that at-risk. Just on that, um, how, do you, how does a, a leader know they've got at-risk customers? What would be some obvious signals that they've got at-risk customers? Well, you know, that's, that's really something that you try to find out from your lost customers, right? So, so when you, uh, when you're out surveying customers, uh, you know, who had, who had left, when you're doing this research, you want to ask them, you know, where did, where did things start to go sideways? You know, um, uh, what did you do? You know, I mean, you know, and this, you know, you've got to, you've got to really dig and find data points. And it's, it's very different for all industry for, you know, for all different industries, you know, of course, there's always the obvious stuff too. Like if you're a software company and they, they were a the subscription service and they, they log in less and less, or, you know, they're not opening your emails. Well, that's all really easy, but, but, you know, I, I but there's a lot of behaviors. Like, you know, I was talking to a gentleman in the, uh, in the car industry and there's all kinds of data points he had found over, over a period of uh, two or three years of talking to customers that he had lost and not come back, all these different little data points he found. So, so yeah, that's something. But when you talk to past customers, they can start to uh, give you the breadcrumbs, these insights uh, that can trail you back and so that you can spot those. You might not have those data points. You might not need to start gathering those data points to mm-hmm. track, the, to find those at-risk customers. Yeah. And is that beyond beyond an NPS score or net promoter score? So it's really interesting, kind of leading indicators. Yeah, I think it goes, f- you know, far beyond that. This is something mm-hmm. that the 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 if you if you know who's got one foot out the door, um, you, you who's the easiest person to to save? You know, the person who isn't who's still with you and isn't is, hasn't hasn't left yet. Yeah, one leg and, one and, leg out and one foot in, but. I like that data points one too, and it is very industry specific um, as well. And I had one of my you know, clients was able to, he was watching, uh, he was watching call planning. And so he felt one of the leading indicators he had was when the sales team were getting um, less access was, was one data point okay. he had that they yeah. previously had as so a less access to uh, higher C-suite was one. Uh, another access he had, uh, sorry, a point he had data point was when they were getting less um traction so the sales cycle started to go out and the velocity and the funnel started to go out 
on accounts that had previously been you know reasonably fast through the through the funnel or their their meeting their meetings were able to be flowing they seemed to get distance between the meetings started opening up they were they were example data points they're not for every industry as you mentioned but yeah. um they're examples aren't they of just you know there's some signs here there are i mean i mean it, you know it can be as simple as cross sales how how often does this does this person tend to buy like you know we like we mentioned before right a, a, an existing loyal customer you know, buys upsells at a rate about five times what a regular, uh, a new customer does. So have they, have they stopped buying your upsells? If, you know, if they stopped buying your cross sales, um, you know, there's anyway, there's all kinds of things that, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's but to so be useful. aware of them and to, and to actually have it as they're important, um, the leading indicators. But one of the things I kind of blew me away, I was reading your um, great little benchmarking piece of research. And one of the things that said on there was around, um, was around, it was just under 50%, I think it was 47% of people you win back spend double of what they were spending when they were your client. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, only 4% spend less. So about 50% spend uh, more than they did the first time around and about 46% uh, spend the same. And, you know, when you think about it, if, I, if, uh, if I'm your customer and... Uh, and I spent X number of dollars, and then I go to the competition, right? And you bring me back. Well, I've seen the other side of the street. I've seen that the grass really isn't greener over there, right? <laughs> That's right. You've actually been, I, I've seen the competition, I've seen you, and I've chosen you again. So I'm going to be more loyal to you because what, is the cha- what, are, what are the chances of, a, of, uh, of some AE coming over and scooping me up now? Because, you know, I've already seen, I've already, you know, tried somebody else. So so you're, you know, they're more loyal because of that reason. Um, and another really cool uh, thing is that a past customer, when they return, they take, they, they take up their old buying activity again, right? They don't act like a new customer. So they're buying more. So, so there's a lot of reasons why uh, customer lifetime value doubles or more for returning customers. And, you know, just one other data point is that this isn't just my study that said this. Um, Harvard Business Review did a study, or they published a study that with uh, about 40,000 customers. And what they found was that um, the second lifetime value was about 1.2 times that of the first lifetime value. So this is not a, this isn't just from my study. Well, I can give you as a valid one from Melbourne, Australia. It certainly was my experience in enterprise sales, um, winning back customers that we may have lost when I was in the IT uh, sector that we may have lost, you know, an aberration, a shiny new toy uh, for all the reasons we talked about a bit earlier. But if you're authentic and solid and you may have been usurped by someone who had something new or offered an amazing price point, but when that ran out or that particular person left or whatever it was, and they did come back, it, absolutely. They wanted to, they got back on the, the contracts. They got back on the systems. They kind of knew all the people. So that was yeah, the relationships yeah. came back together again. And, and frankly, I think that was interesting. One of the things I found, and I'm not sure if this came up in your research, Dan, but I found that even when a company left and moved to another, the company, the, 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 cu- the customer who left, there were like 60 to 70% of the people in that organization didn't want to leave. All right. And so they were really happy when they went back to the existing, the pre-existing or original supplier. So they were oh, ready yeah. to go again. They're almost like, yeah, well, it wasn't our decision. And we're you know, so happy to be back. And I felt that that's, that was certainly my experience. And so I'm, I totally agree with your number. I think it's, it's, it's really solid that return and the, the ROI back on, on win back to me is, is amazing. So amazing. My next question to you is given it's so amazing, given the stuff you're finding out now, why are so many marketers and leaders so focused on net new rather than looking at win back? Well, that's a huge question, you know, and, and, and what I've, what I've, what I've heard, what I've found is that, you know, if you've got a CEO and they've got to go and they've got to, you know, get the next round of funding, well, they've got to go stand in front of those people and say, and show them, you know, we got like a hundred net new logos in the last quarter, you know, and, and that, because that's what, that's what these PE firms and these VEC firms want. Right. So what is the, so what does the CEO do? Well, you know, that's what he asks the salespeople, you know, the, all the, the revenue people, you know, yeah. how many net new logos have you got that, you know, you get, you, you get rewarded you know, what gets done, what gets rewarded gets done. And, you know, so you say, well, 
why doesn't customer success do it? Well, you know, they're really not compensated for that either. They're not, there's, and, and I don't want to say it's crazy, but it's crazy. You know, I mean, <laughs> this, this is the, the cost of reacquiring a client is, is a fraction of what it costs to get them. The, the, the amount of time it takes to get them on board is a fraction of what it takes to get them. You know, they, they, they're, they're worth more. I mean, the sales velocity of a, of a, of a win back is massive compared to any other type of customer I've seen. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? So I, I think that's a very good point. So it's driven, you know, from from the top or, um, you know, it gets what gets for it. Yeah, reward it gets done. I think that's a really good point. Uh, it's like Charlie Munger's comment, isn't it? Show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. Um, exactly. I think it's, yeah. it's exactly that. It's exactly that. Now, you talked about, um, I think in, in the research I read also, there was three types of costs when you gained a win back. There was three levels of cost um, yeah. you spoke about. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. So, so there's companies that like say a staffing company, right? You might need to, it's not just one person you're, um, you're taking out, you might be whining and dining an entire team, right? So there's a whole, those are whole nights out, you know, um, you might, so that, that's one example of something mm-hmm. like high cost. So, so um, uh, the kind of ROI people with high costs have like those kind of costs, uh, you know, they typically run in the, you know, they get like 20 to 40 percent, 20 to 40 X ROI. Uh, that yeah. example, the staffing company, they got a 32 X ROI. Right. I think, you know, uh, then there's a whole nother level where uh, all it takes to win people back is something like, you know, a direct outreach, direct email outreach with some kind of lumpy mail, you know, where yeah. it might be five or 10 bucks uh, per per person you're going out with. Uh, so those kind of, those kind of, uh, uh, campaigns, uh, they generate more like 150 X ROI, um, with higher value. Like if, uh, uh, a friend of mine, he did a, a campaign with the, um, Texas Rangers and what they did is it was just a, a postcard mailing and he got 173 X ROI. Now the postcard was very cheap and the cost of winning back somebody, you know, a season ticket holder was very high and that's why the ROI was high. So that's the second level of, of, um, of win back. But the third level, and this is the most common, it's like 50% of the time. It's simply an email followed by a phone call or phone call and email. What is the cost of a phone call and email? You've already got the staff repurp, you know, drive them to do this for, you know, three hours a week, you know, and, um, and the ROI on that is just nuts, right? You know, you, you, you win back a hundred thousand dollar account and it took, you know, five phone calls, you know, what is the, What's the ROI on that? It's, 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 you know, it's massive, isn't it? But it's yeah. about, I think it's also about the, uh, the sales leader um, saying to the team, you know, let's spend 30 minutes, three days a week or an hour, three days a week on win back, like actually having it as a strategy, as opposed to an ad hoc or accidental thing we might do. We're actually focused on win back and putting that time aside to, um, to do that. I think it's really what is the key to that, isn't it? Yeah. And I think one of the, one of the big things is like, one of the reasons I did the study is to have data around this. Like there just isn't any data. So, so, you know, the, if, if, uh, if a sales manager knew that on average, 26% of past customers return. And if they knew that customer lifetime value doubles or more, and if they heard all these other, uh, you know, uh, CROs and CSOs who say that uh, WinBack has generated a higher ROI than anything else they've, they've done, at least 71% in the study said that, you know, um, they would, they might, they might consider it. Yeah, I, I, consider it, I would. Know? I would hope so too. I, I think it's. I think it's really interesting. I another thing I picked up, Dan, in the in your um, study was uh, there was a thing around the gig economy and just um, and it was really interesting about the loss there. So and and for people who have um, you know who are in consulting businesses and the like, and and so the point that was made in the report that you haven't actually lost the customer; you've just lost that particular gig. Right. And so the customer, for whatever reason, didn't think you did that or had boxed you in some other space. And so a lot of the reaction is, oh, we lost we lost that customer to so and so, our competitor. And the point made in the report was, well, actually, no, you haven't. That that customer still values you and what you did. There was still the trust level there. There was still the barbecue test. We'd still feel comfortable having a, a coffee together. But the, but they hadn't seen you as being right for this need. But if you went back on another need, if you went back on, hey, this is where we think the market's going, can we help you there? The win back was actually very possible 
because you already had the established relationship. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. And it's not only the relationship, you know, you've seen inside their company, you know, you've seen, you, you've, you, you know, who the decision makers are, you know, how they think, you know, what they value. And so what you could do is like, say you, you put product X into 12 companies. Well, four of them might be able to use product Y that you could create and, 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 and a few could, could do product Z. So, you know, having that, having that intimate client knowledge is, is, is massive, just massive. Yeah, I, and I was talking to, um, before our call today, just surprisingly, I was talking to a keynote speaker I know, and I was sharing this information and, and it was blew him away. And he said, God, you know, there's so many businesses that I've worked intimately with and conferenced with and met their people and met their leadership team and have a line, but I've, you know, I haven't done something after, you know, one year or two years later, but I still have this great rapport. And he, and he said to me, wow, I, I just, just changed. he was freaking out. He said, this has just changed my whole concept because I kind of felt that I'd, I, that they'd ever moved on. But he said, actually, I, now I'm reconsidering. Maybe they, maybe they haven't, they just haven't heard from me. Yeah. You know, some people, when I did the study, I, I talked to, you know, over a hundred people or I, I was in contact with over a hundred people and, uh, it, it, it was funny, you know, some people thought that thought of their, the, the reason they had this win back frame of mind is they never thought they had lost the customer. The customer just wasn't doing business with them. And it's your job to find a way of doing business with them. And I thought that was a really interesting mindset, you know, mm. and uh, um, yeah. Customers have so much choice, you know, and there's so much noise in the market as well. Um, and I, so I think, and, and if you think about all those customers we've done business with over time, you know, this is why I think the, the, the win back is, is so important rather than chasing the net you going back because also people are changing all the time as well. But you have oftentimes you have more intimate knowledge now than someone who's new. So someone if they've got a new sales director or a new marketing director, for example, and you've worked with them maybe over a three year period, but, but maybe you haven't worked with them in the last six months, you've still got way more intimate knowledge than that new marketing director or sales director has. You've got so much value to give, I think, in that. Definitely. Um, and that yeah. Definitely. You, you've got so much more value. Uh, you've seen things that they haven't seen. You can help that person out. And, and it's not only that, but you know, when you leave an account, you should really try, or when an account leaves you, you should really try to make sure you, you know, you, you leave on the best possible terms that you, you know, follow them on LinkedIn uh, or, or something, comment every once in a while so that, you know, you, that you're, you stay top of mind and, and also try to dig in and get multiple contacts in a company. Because when you go back to, to win back, when you go to try to win back, especially a larger account, one person might, one of your contacts might not be interested, but another one might be. I, mean, I just see mm. this over and over again, you know? So, so when you leave, you know, try to make sure you can leave with a couple of contacts if you can and, and, and give them gentle touches every once in a while. Yeah. I, I use a concept. Um, I don't know if you know, but Dan called, um, you know, shadow account management and that, and I've done this with a couple of you know, clients who left uh, for whatever reason. Um, and I remember one being in that I just sort of taken on a sales leadership role and, we, had, we lost an account. Was, I couldn't do anything about it. It was too new. Uh, but I, what I did say to them was, we really value this account and we understand why you're leaving. We, we get it. Um, and and we great luck with you know where you're going. But we want you to know this, that if it's okay with you, we're going to just shadow your the account. So we're going to shadow what you do in the market and what's going on with you, if that's okay. We're going to touch base with you. You know, just every quarter, just check in. And we know, you, we know that you won't do business with it because you've signed a contract with someone else. But we want you to know this, that should that contract ever go pear-shaped, should something ever change, we're ready to pick it up. We'll be ready to pick it up and resume. Uh, and I've never had a, um, you know, a client who's left go, oh, no, don't do that, <laughs> right? Because it's risk mitigation for them. Yep. Oh, definitely. And, and, and letting them know every once in a while, I mean, this is what one Fortune 100 uh, company uh, person, I won't mention the, the name of the company, said that's what they do. They keep, they they try to keep up with their needs, actually stay in contact with the, with the with the past customer, so that they can actually literally start them up again with like within three or four weeks. So they can say, you yes. know what, we're 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 pissed at our new people, 
what can you do? And they can literally be ready in, in uh, up and running in a few weeks. Yeah. I mean, I was shocked that, that somebody would do that within a company, but when you've got a great relationship with somebody and you didn't want them to leave and you know, your superior is the one that made that decision. Um, these things happen. It does. And sometimes, as you said, the grass isn't always as greener on the other yeah. side. And they may well go, well, actually, you know, we, we don't want to win or someone made a decision above my head or overseas, which happens. Uh, and we want to come back. So uh, I always think, yeah, don't, don't, you know, stay, stay in touch, stay connected, but do it as you talked about. And I love the name of your, your business, by the way, strategic win back is exactly what it is. A strategic <laughs> win back, not accidental win back. No, don't call it that. No, I love that strategic win back. It's such an important thing. Hey, Dan, um, Tell us more. Where can we find out more about you and, and also more about the research you've done? Because I think you've got that that's able to be downloaded, I think. So tell us more about that. Yeah. So the uh, my website is strategicwinback.com. And uh, we've got the study on that page. And uh, so there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting data. And there's a couple of case studies. Jeb Blunt actually is a case study and Jill Griffin, who's like the, the mother of Winback. Right. Uh, she did the a mother of Winback. I like that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey, she, you know, she, she uh, broke the broke ground in like the, in the year 2000, you know? Um, so anyway, so there's that um, I've, I've written a number of articles and I've uh, where I've interviewed people who've done tremendous, amazing things with Winback also. So those uh, that's on LinkedIn. Um, and what's your you LinkedIn do? on? Can you give us your LinkedIn? Yeah. Uh, Dan, D-A-N-M, Fister, P as in Peter, F like Frank, I-S-T-E-R. So uh, Dan M. Fister. Um, and the other thing is, if you're, you know, if you're wondering, you know, is win back for me or, you know, from a very high level, I've got a calculator mm. and, you know, based on the data we got out of the uh, uh, study. And so if you just go to the website, strategicwinback.com and click on the calculator, and what you can do is you can put in the number of past clients you've got, uh, the kind of money that you think uh, that, that they've spent, like as an aggregate, and uh, what you're willing to, uh, to, to, to pay to win them back, or, you know, different numbers. And you can just fool around with that calculator, and you can see, geez, you know, there's something here, or you might find, you know what, win back isn't for me. Yeah, that's a fantastic tool, Dan. Hey, Dan, it's been fantastic having you on the show. You've given us such great things. A lot of people think it's not possible to win back customers. You've clearly shown not only is it possible, it's definitely worth doing. And it's actually should be part of your strategic uh, weaponry if you're in, in sales and marketing. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Rob. It was great to be here. Hey, thanks for listening. And we hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe and rate the podcast you listen to so we can continue to serve and inspire others. Remember, connect to us on all the social media channels. The Out of the Possible podcast is hosted by me, Rob Hartnett, and produced by Finn Hartnett. Connect with us directly on LinkedIn, Rob Hartnett, H A R T N E T T, and Finn Hartnett. This podcast is a part of the C Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com. <laughs> <laughs>